Hi everyone, I'm Spiro with NewsBud.com. In this week's episode of NewsBud's Roundtable, we're going to be picking up where we left off from our previous episode titled, The Organ Standoff. Could this not guilty verdict restore faith in the judicial system? If you have not yet seen that episode, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, This week we're joined by attorney Roger Roots, who had a ringside seat at what is being called the Organ Standoff Trial as a volunteer researcher and paralegal for Ryan Bundy, who represented himself at the trial. We also have another attorney joining us today, Mr. Todd McFarlane, who is a NewsBud legal analyst and formerly represented the Finicum family. As always, I'm joined by editor and founder of NewsBud, Sabelle Edmonds. Sabelle, how are you? Very well, good. Thank you, Spiro, and it's great to be here. And I'm really excited for this follow-up episode, and I'm so glad that we are doing this back-to-back while things are still really fresh. And uh, last time we had a great long conversation with Todd, and uh, unfortunately we couldn't connect with Roger. And uh, today we'll get to ask some questions about these trials and his experience with the trial, uh, uh, which is, I think, is one of the most amazing, pleasantly surprising cases that I have seen in in years, I have to say, especially coming out of uh, the federal courts. Uh, I have dealt with federal courts with my own case. My own case went all the way to the Supreme Court. So uh, it's good to be with you, gentlemen. And uh, let's start with uh, Roger. Roger, um, you were there and uh, and, uh, you heard the verdict and let's just briefly uh, have you describe your reaction. What were you expecting? Because uh, talking with Todd, we heard that the case, government's case was so weak. Unfortunately, in federal courts, you don't have real-time camera set so that people like us, journalists or people or family members of defendants, nobody can sit and watch and go through all this evidence. And we know that the federal government spent millions, millions of dollars, no camera in court. They brought in dozens and dozens of witnesses, uh, more than a dozen uh, informants, and uh, and they couldn't, in the end, make a case. So you had 12 men and women sitting there hearing all this million dollars case piled up by the federal government, the phony case, against the defendants, they conferred, they came, and they issued the not guilty verdict in all counts. But where are you expecting this, Roger? Um, I actually, well, I had my fingers crossed. I'll tell you, we met every single prosecution claim with evidence uh, for the defense. And we, I think that we successfully countered every single piece of government evidence. Uh, was I expecting it? I hate to say it. It it is a shame that none of us, the system has become so uh, favorable to the government that we're surprised when innocent people are found not guilty. And it's a shame. But I, frankly, I was expecting the jury would come back with some not guilty verdicts, uh, at least for uh, some of the defendants. And I knew that, frankly, the defendant I was working for, Ryan Bundy and his brother, Ammon Bundy, were the real targets of the Justice Department. And that that was my biggest fear, I think, was that the jury would come back with some kind of a mixed verdict and would clear some of the other defendants, but might uh, just to give the government a bone, sort of. Uh, I I, I guess I was a little bit fearful, but uh, I knew that... uh, Ammon, Ryan, really all the defendants were not guilty of the crimes they were accused of. And so was I surprised? It's hard to say. It it is a shame, but maybe in a a little bit I was surprised that the jury saw through the government's uh, disinformation and came back with the proper verdict. Uh, So let me step back a little bit here and, and ask you this. Why did you take the case? Why why did you say sure? I will I will help you represent yourself to uh, Ryan Bundy. Um, well, I had gotten several phone calls, and uh, um, I I was aware of the case even before it was it was you know even before uh, Lavoie was murdered, uh, and so I was following it a little bit, 
And I, I had I worked for a, another client who actually was very in tune and was very um, um, very closely watching and following the case. He called me up and he said, "Roger, you really need to get involved in this case. Uh, they really need you out there." And I had actually several people who actually paid my way out to Portland uh, to see if I could help out in any way. And of course, a lot of us who are familiar, I know Sabelle, you're familiar. Um, you know, you, most of us who are familiar with federal court, you know, you just said it yourself. We are used to losing. I mean, the, the powers of government have become so powerful that, um, you know, it, it, we all anticipated that what would happen is those poor guys would be led down a road where they'd be they'd simply be told to plead guilty. There would be some plea uh, agreements in which they would plead guilty to some counts. Maybe other counts would be dropped. That's the typical modus operandi of the Justice Department. Um, anyway, I had people say, Roger, you need to get out there and help those guys. Do whatever you can. And so I initially met actually with Ryan Payne initially, um, had some discussions with his team. Uh, ultimately, he retained uh, his attorney out there. Uh, when I learned that um, Ryan Bundy had essentially fired his court-appointed lawyer, um, I actually went to the Multnomah County Jail just to visit and say hello to Ryan Bundy. You know, lawyers, Todd can, Todd can attest to this. Lawyers are so overregulated. We are not allowed to approach a, a potential client or a potential defendant who we know is represented by a, another attorney. We have to go through that attorney. The system has so many ways of controlling the outcomes and one of the ways of controlling the outcomes is by keeping good lawyers from meeting with good defendants who need the good lawyers. And it's so sad. I mean, I could tell you a thousand stories about this. But anyway, at the point that I read that Ryan Bundy was firing his court-appointed lawyer, I said, well, why don't I just go visit with Ryan Bundy in the in the jail, which I did. I have a Rhode Island bar card, actually. I'm an out-of-state out of lawyer. And I, I was able to get in and, and had a nice conversation with Ryan Bundy, and he very much wanted me to work on his team. And I said, okay. And, and we had some preliminary discussions. Um, I had actually later on, several weeks before the trial started, submitted a, an application to be a, sta an, a second standby lawyer, uh, a second to Lisa Ludwig. Uh, you know, the modern court process is so evil, I think, and I'll just say it, that... Uh, you know, a lot of lower federal courts have overturned uh, Supreme Court rulings allowing people to represent themselves. Uh, a case called uh, Feretta versus California, a very famous case, U.S. Supreme Court decision. It says the Sixth Amendment right to counsel gives you an absolute right to counsel if you choose and an absolute right if you choose to represent yourself. And I hate to say it, but the lower federal judges in the years since Ferretta v. California, have virtually overturned the case because what happens in real practice is, in federal court at least, uh, upon a defendant firing his lawyer and saying he wants to represent himself, Todd can tell you what really happens. The judge then imposes a government-approved lawyer or a judge-approved lawyer. And I'm not, I don't want to pick on Lisa Ludwig. She did some good things. She did an okay job, frankly. But imposed upon Ryan... Lisa Ludwig, a good lawyer, by the way, uh, to be standby uh, counsel. And so I, I, right before trial, I, I filed a motion to be second standby counsel to Ryan and then allowing him to represent himself with me and Lisa helping him. Judge did not like that. I don't know what it was. She didn't like me, didn't like I'm an out-of-state lawyer. I'm not part of the little establishment there. And I'm just, you know, that's, that's the real world that lawyers have to navigate through. And so I actually almost begged. I don't know if Todd was there that day, but I practically had to beg just to be a paralegal in the case. Judge finally approved it, and uh, so I was able to sit at the at the desk at the table with uh, with Ryan Bundy. And but I was not allowed to speak. I was able to assist him, whisper in his ear, shuffle paperwork, do re research, you know, talk between. You know, I was able to assist in every way, but I was not able to speak. Uh, in the courtroom. It was sort of astounding, but I actually had a great time, and I think I helped him a lot. And I just want to chime in and say I, I think Roger really did help 
a lot, not just with Ryan, but with the entire case. And one of the reasons I want to say that is because with all the legal teams involved, very few of them actually had the kind of background with these kind of what I'm going to call liberty issues that Roger does. Uh, again, by the time they got Marcus Mumford and Morgan Philpot involved, and obviously they had to be privately retained to get attorneys who that had that kind of background, those kind of qualifications. And I'm just going to put it like this, who really care about these kinds of issues. And I think that that's one of Roger's biggest qualifications is that he cares. He's not just appointed, you know, a lot of attorneys, of course, they've got egos and all of that stuff. They love to win cases if they're given an opportunity to. But when it comes to the real issues, and I think that applies to some of the attorneys in this case, actually, they're on the other side of the fence philosophically. They are very liberal. They come from Portland. This case was, they were fish out of water in terms of dealing with this case. But Roger comes from a completely different background and expertise and experience. So he brought a lot to the table. And I think he played a very invaluable role for Ryan Bundy. That's my opinion. That's a very important point, Todd, because I represented over 144 whistleblowers, government whistleblowers. And I can tell you from the experience, firsthand experience, but also through the experiences of high level veteran uh, agents and analysts with agencies like FBI, CIA, NSA, when we did the right thing, when we exposed government criminality, when we went down this path called whistleblowing journey, one of the hardest things was to even find an attorney who was willing to represent us. You have no idea, especially in Washington, D.C. area, how many doors were slammed. They said, First of all, it will be costly and nobody, and this is what they said, nobody would win ever against those intelligence law enforcement agencies. So even for publicity, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't take it. And then of course, it's being incestuous because when you're in Washington DC, about seven or eight uh, out of 10 law firms, they have some sort of government contracts. So you go and you knock on the door and you say, I need an attorney. <laughs> I want someone to protect my First Amendment right. And they would say, oh, we are representing DOJ in this case and this case, and we have uh, several FBI cases, and we are really getting paid well. So even if they had, let's say, a department or division that could take us, it would then they would get retaliated against these law firms by the government. And that was their bread and butter, basically, government contracts or government, the word of mouth through the government. So you had all these honorable people, let's exclude me here, I don't want to call myself honorable here, but really, people with solid cases, First Amendment cases, and we could not secure attorneys. So I learned one thing here. For example, with the things that we are doing here, with the activities that we are involved, which all involve First Amendment, okay? We get into some situation. I know that you, Todd, and you, Roger, are going to get calls. So, um, so I'm so glad. I'm so heartened to see that there are actually. I know there are all these jokes about lawyers and attorneys. They are attorneys out there who still really have conscience and uh, and and they do things because they believe in. It's so rare to see, or at least it was. Maybe East Coast is a little bit different than the West and especially in the Western states, but uh, it's really heartening. Now, Roger, I went through these steps with, uh, with Todd, and I know I'm going to sound like an idiot, but I'm going to do that and sound like an idiot again because we had almost, almost nine months where the mainstream media, the pseudo-alternative liberal media, and publications like Oregonian build up this false notion this false case in the heads of people around the country, I would say around 98%, if I were to throw statistics, people throw statistics freely, right and left anyway. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw my, my 98% of the people in the US, they, they believe, even right now, 
maybe because they think that all the jury members were crazy or something. But they believe that these men engaged in utter violence. They were engaged in violence against law enforcement. They were engaged in violence against the local people. They inflicted millions of dollars of damage to to this um, to this reserve to this to this uh, land where they were protesting, and that they are these scumbag low lives who are violent and uh, and uh, and they take their guns and they just go and shoot people. Okay, this is the picture that was painted for seven months, led by Oregonian because they happen to be the local. Uh, news organization. I don't want to even at this stage call them news organization. So that's why I'm going to go ahead for the sake of those 98% who have heard nothing but those made up fiction and walk you through the same thing. So these 12 members of jury, their verdict was not guilty in the case of these men, these defendants, seven of them here, inflicted any violence and, and injured or hurt anyone or shot at anyone with their guns. Did they did they shoot people? Did they injure anyone? Any of these defendants, seven defendants, Roger? Uh, in no way, absolutely not. In fact, you know what what's re what really became astounding is that the narrative the government was building was so overwhelmingly false and disproven in front of the jury, um, and yet. Uh, that narrative still prevailed in the newspapers that were reporting on the trial. It, it, it was really astounding. And I, I think, you know, some I heard someone say that the Oregonian newspaper should get a Pulitzer. Oh, my God. <laughs> it, it, their coverage was horrible. It was horrible. In fact, if you got your information from, from the Oregonian or, or any of the largest uh, so-called news outlets, uh, you would be forgiven in, 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 in believing those defendants had no defense whatsoever when, in fact, the, the evidence that was being presented in the courtroom was so different. You know, one thing, I'll just give an example. The government put on photographs of these heavily armed militia guys uh, standing next to a highway. And, you know, these guys had body armor on, uh, helmets and they were, you know, wearing, uh, you know, they were bearing, uh, you know, AR-15 or sem some semi-automatic uh, riflery, you know, totally with, with, uh, you know, ammunition uh, pouches of all kinds, and, and 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 the government put that those photographs into evidence. When it became uh, time for the defense, we were able to show that in fact. Those photographs are of people that were outside the refuge. They weren't among the defendants. They were some militia guys that had come down. Some of them publicly disavowed the defendants. This is astounding. The government put on pictures of people who disavowed the defendants and yet tried to link the defendants to those pictures. It, it really was astounding. Uh, it, 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 was, it, was all, it was deceptive, frankly. Well, oh, and the same goodness. thing was true with the gun show, all the guns. So they bring in 34 guns that were found at the refuge, but they were not able to tie hardly any of them to the defendants in the case. I mean, there, there are, I think, are example after example of exactly what Roger is talking about, of basically the way the prosecution tried to deceive the jury, but the mainstream media has used all of that same kind of evidence to deceive the American public. That's, I mean, I, in a nutshell, uh, that because they've been so biased and slanted in their approach that the public, they don't get the opportunity to see the other side of the story like the jury had the opportunity to once the defense started putting on its case. And so that I, was I think exactly the, the point I wanted to show to our viewers, especially the 98 percent of our nation, OK, who sat there and watched their CNN and read their Washington Post. They read their Salon magazine, Mother Jones, you name it. Basically, 90 percent of them are owned by, you know, the, the their government mouthpiece operated via these foundations, the alternative ones. Well, they call themselves alternative, mostly funded by George Soros. But OK, 
So basically, these publications, the media, and, and that includes the so-called alternative media, they were giving the public these pictures and these images that they basically were getting from the government. They were there helping government make its case. Now, question number two, as far as threatening people, Roger, uh, it, from what I understand and from what the jury, jury verdict says, these men and women never went around threatened anyone. Did they go around with their guns and threaten anyone, Roger? Uh, you know, it's astounding that not a single piece of evidence of a single threat by any specific defendant aimed at any, uh, you know, BLM employee or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee was ever introduced. I mean, what the government was trying to do was stack inference upon inference, like Todd mentioned. All this ammunition, you know, all, all, all this, these rifles and firearms and things, um, you know, and, 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 you know, taking a stand and th this kind of thing, you know. And, well, they were there. They did have people at the front gate. Um, but, you know, we, we showed that, in fact, the guys at the front gate more or less were there as, um, well, sort of to protect the people inside from some kind of an attack. Uh, they were greeters, like you'd see at Walmart. They were a security, a, a security team that was 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 the, the you know the 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 real purpose was to for the safety of all concerned, including the fact that there were women and children in there in there, and and they needed someone at the gate to to keep everyone safe and to be friendly. Uh, the one uh, young man that we put on, uh, God, I forget his name now. Maybe Todd remembers. Nice, nice young man in his 20s who admitted on trial at, on the stand. And, of course, he was threatened in every way by the Justice Department with prosecution himself. I mean, it, they openly said, well, he needs to retain counsel. Someone needs to get a defense lawyer for him before he testifies. Well, the kid, uh, Ma uh, Matthew De uh, Deathridge was his name. Great young man. He took the stand very bravely. And he said, yeah, I was there. I, I stood so-called guard duty. And my, uh, I saw my, my duty as being as friendly as I could to everybody who came to the front gate and to let everybody in, including U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or BLM employees. So another point I think it's uh, important with respect to the guards and the entry point, all of that, that if you understand this whole concept of adverse possession and, and Ammon Bundy, his position was that he was staking an adverse possession claim. And there's a whole bunch of different elements of adverse possession, but one is that you have to control access. And so at the very least, even if they were allowing everyone to come through and do all of that stuff, they were still doing what was necessary in terms of controlling access. You see all kinds of private property and even public property do that sort of thing even in parking lots where they will have a cable across or something so that they can block that off, even if it's once a year or once a month or whatever the case may be, so that they can claim that at whatever point they controlled access in such a way that no one else could claim an, access, an adverse possession claim. And so I think it goes hand in hand with what they were trying to accomplish in that regard too. Okay, Roger, one other uh according from what I find out, uh, I have been finding out, it's been established as a fiction, but let the 98% of our nation know. And this, again, Oregonian broadcast this constantly. In fact, Spira and I, we live in Central Oregon. We are in Bend, Oregon. And even our uh, local uh, publication, which is mainly about cafes and coffees and dope and tattoos, but they even had it on their, on their front page that these violent men... Me these these horrible violent men uh, caused millions of millions of dollars damage on on this national land. Now, uh, is this true? Had the jury reached this conclusion that these men and women damaged millions, inflicted millions of dollars of damage? Absolutely not true. In fact, uh, you know that that actually is something that I was initially working on a lot. I had lined up uh, some accountants and some uh, an, an auditor who was going to fly up, and um, uh, even economists 
to try to pick apart and analyze that those claims. The government has uh, had a series of press conferences and press releases in which they have made these bizarre, astounding claims. Six point, I believe, eight million dollars of damages that they are claiming in, in some public uh, press releases that uh, were caused by the defendants at the Malheur Wildlife Refuge. Interestingly enough, um, the government at the trial sort of stipulated that they weren't going to bring that stuff up because they knew that we were getting ready. We really were. We were getting ready to meet every one of those claims with some counterclaims and some, we were going to really cross-examine that stuff hard. And I think when they realized that, they sort of stipulated, no, we're, we're not going to bring that stuff up in this trial. And every time we tried to bring up the fact that they were sort of gilding the lily, if you've ever heard that phrase, they were uh, over-exaggerating the monetary damage claims. And we wanted to get that in because they were, I mean, they literally were lying. And I, 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 it might come into play in the next trial in Portland. Uh, it may actually come into play in restitution arguments that are going to take place with some of these gentlemen who have already pled guilty. Okay, so this these kinds of claims may still be uh, have some hearings and things. All right, but I can tell you that some some uh, auditors and and accountants who make a living examining. Uh, line item claims of, of losses and expenses and things have told me that, in fact, uh, the claims the government has made need to be carefully analyzed and that they are so astoundingly large that they should trigger an independent investigation and perhaps a criminal investigation because it appears and again, I don't want to get too deep into the details. I have some information I don't want to reveal, but it appears that at the very moment this occupation began, uh, the government was was in a an actual scheme to uh, increase the so-called damages as much as they could. And I don't want to get into some witnesses that I know for a fact. Uh, uh, I don't want to go deep into this, but there are there are some witnesses who uh, were prepared to discuss the fact that they were told, for example, when they went in to bid on on contracting afterward to so-called rebuild the so-called damage that they were told to bid high and and to to go way above what uh, you know what what any what would be normal in fact all the evidence that actually was shown at trial is that the defendants were cleaning up the place they were fixing the place they were very careful with the place some of them discussed the fact that the US government had allowed the the buildings uh, at the at the Malheur Refuge to come into disrepair. That there were uh, rat droppings and and uh, mice all over the place. That evidence actually did come in a little bit. But every time we tried to bring up the overspending of the government, it was an objection, irrelevant. Objection, irrelevant. They brought in at least 200 government agents into that town of Burns, Oregon, during that period. They took over the town. Uh, all of them were on overtime. I've I've spoken to witnesses who said that they would go up and talk to some of the officers, and they were from different agencies. Some were federal, some were state. Some had been flown in from far away, and, and, and they were openly joking about all the money, the double overtime that they were making, to do nothing, essentially. And it was all going to be billed to the Bundys if the Bundys were convicted. Well, and I think that's an important point when we talk about damages, because a lot of people have this idea and, and the media has attempted to portray it that way. And so is the government, that the damages that they're talking about and the way that they inflated those numbers and ran them through the roof was that it was damage to the refuge. But the reality is a lot of those figures were padded by exactly what Roger's talking about security, all of the stuff that was going on in Burns really had nothing whatsoever to do with the refuge itself or any alleged damage at the refuge. But they're adding up all of that stuff. Who was it? Uh, Judge Grasty in Harney County. He he tried to put together a, a security detail that was going to cost something like $70,000 a day or something like that a week. I don't remember the exact numbers, but they wanted to include all of that in the so-called damages that they were going to ask restitution for. I mean, 
I think if they had attempted to put on their case in that regard to substantiate those numbers, it would have been just so ridiculous that everybody would have been able to see through it. And that's the reason they didn't want to. Yeah, let me say a couple other, uh, just a couple other quick points. Uh, We don't actually know all the details, but we do know that the BLM employees and their families and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employees and their families were sent away by the government and ordered not to go to work, but they were paid nonetheless. And we don't have all the details, but we believe they were, they must have been staying at the very, the most luxurious, you know, in accommodation somewhere uh, at a level above what the Rolling Stones live at when they are on tour. I mean, the the, uh, expense account uh, amounts that are being discussed are so outrageously high that, uh, again, I've had an auditor say it should trigger an independent investigation, perhaps a criminal investigation, into the overspending. And uh, another aspect I, that we should go into is at the end of the uh, occupation, when the last four uh, uh, defendants left, uh, there was a period of several days, really a week, in which uh, the government came in and swept the place, and they under the under the ruse or the let's just say the, under the claim of bomb, you know, searching for bombs and things. There, there was a, a bomb squad team that went supposedly, and, and it's funny how we don't have photographs or, or video much of this. Went through and and, and they admitted a, in a couple instances that they tore apart the mattresses. They went through the cupboards and opened everything and threw everything out on the floor. It was the, 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 the government, and they admitted a couple times, that it was their teams that threw everything on the floor. They threw the bedding all over. And then they had photographs that, that, that appeared in all the National uh, Associated Press uh, newspapers of, of all of this litter and clutter that, in fact, the government itself was responsible for. Well, they may have defrauded other people as well because for, for, for months here in Bend, Oregon, thanks to Oregonian and the local publication, uh, they started uh, rounding up people, volunteering their time and donating money to clean up these violence uh, man's mess created in there and to help the nature and the land there. So do you think, I mean, as attorneys, these people are going to have a case because they have in a way been defrauded. I mean, they have been donating money and then their own labor when they are under this assumption that they are cleaning after these violent man who caused this litter and whatever else the caused by, by the government. I mean, are they double dipping here? Are they are they collecting and spending a taxpayer's dollar on this and then having these contractors collecting the cream and, and inflate everything? And on top of that, they are getting volunteers here, the liberal side of this town, uh, Ben, and you're going to see people are like grabbing shovels. Other people are writing check because they want to clean up after these violent men who were declared not violent and not inflicting any kind of millions of dollars damage. I mean, it's really going deep with this, what we are calling being defrauded. So, Sibel, I think you've just shown that the government emperor has no clothes. Uh, they That's, in a nutshell, when push comes to shove, they've been parading around, acting as if they're clo- fully dressed and, and uh, attempting to uh, raise all of this money and double dip and exaggerate and do all the things that you've described, but at the end of the day, uh, if you really get down to the bottom line, we can see that the emperor has no clothes and that they've made up most of this stuff and they've created and fabricated most of the evidence. Uh, one one last question on this case before we move to Lavoy Finicum case, and that is, uh, Roger, were you approached by uh, Oregonian after the verdict to talk about the case? Um, no, absolutely not. I've had a a few phone calls from media. Actually, it's funny. I've had more phone calls from Montana media. You know, I'm a libertarian uh, activist and I'm, I was running for Montana secretary of state uh, for the libertarian party in Montana. So uh, several reporters in Montana called me about the case. Oh, because I guess I was a Montana insider to that case and they had some interest in it. 
But no, nothing from the Oregonian, nothing from uh, any of the major reporters about the case. Nothing. Wow. Todd, how Well, about and there's you? a reason for that, because I, I don't think they want to hear Roger's side of the story. Do you? No, I don't think so. I mean, they, 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 they again, if you were a reader of the Oregonian and had never sat in that courtroom, uh, you would be astounded at a not guilty verdict. I mean, I'm sure Todd, you're aware of uh, well, all of you guys uh, reading the, the 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 new the local Portland, Oregon major newspapers uh, was like night and day uh, from uh, in, in, when contrasted with the actual evidence that was being shown in the courtroom. As someone who has gone through tons of experience with bad, evil media outlets, I have to say this. I really have to say this on the record. I have never seen such degree of unethical journalism. I mean, down filthy unethical journalism. Uh, one of them retired. Who was that weasel? Uh, Les what? Uh, what was the guy? Who would this Les guy? Zates. He wanted... Yeah, exactly. This guy would try to blend in. I mean, and he's reporting directly to this governor, Kate Brown, and, and she's another basket case. We'll, we'll refer to her, uh, to her later. But this man would put his cowboy hat and his cowboy boots and come try to blend in there. And the weasel would go and put so many, so much false information. And, and, and like the dogs of the governor... They went as far as bringing a lawsuit against the sheriff there, Sheriff Palmer. I mean, I've never seen any, I mean, anything like this. And, and ironically, Oregonian once upon a time had this reputation of a, of, a, of a local paper with integrity. They had won award and several awards, but supposedly from the interviews I have conducted, from the conversations I've had, they had this purge, they had this cleanup several years ago during that corrupt governor, you know, the criminal governor who left. And then this semi-criminal governor, this woman, Kate Brown, came and took the seat that they have been basically working directly under the governor's office, both the previous one and the current one. And they let go of all the good people who brought them those awards and that reputation. So that is supposedly the story. But I have to say, uh, from that uh, Bernstein, Maxine Bernstein to Les, I have never seen this level of unethical false, one-sided ideologue reporting that went, because you had a lot of papers around the country because they are the local paper, paper here, so they picked up their story. They wouldn't send their own reporters. What they would do was to take their stories. And oh, one other question, because I have been getting this from our commenters, from our subscribers, people who have watched our previous episode. I know it's too early for both of you, the question to tell, but they said with everything, and this is the question, and I'm going to rephrase it, being found not guilty, going through what they went through, are they planning to bring any lawsuit for, for unlawful, unlawful treatment they received, really, in many ways? And that may even include the Oregonian, because... I mean, that would set such an example, and I know it would be a very expensive lawsuit. Do you, do you expect to see a lawsuit being brought by these defendants against the government, but also against these unethical people posing as journalists with the Oregonian? Roger? Well, I'm going to jump in on, I'm gonna sure. jump in on that one. Um, I don't know exactly what their case or cause of action would be against the media unless they can bring a cause of action for defamation and and I'm not going to go there um you know there there's all kinds of wiggle room there's a lot all kinds of gray zone there but on with respect to the government from my perspective and Roger I'll be interested to hear what you have to say but I think all of these defendants and especially those who have been incarcerated this whole time Ammon and Ryan and David Fry I think that they've got a great civil rights case against the government, the whole stop. I mean, from start to finish, uh, I think they've got a great civil rights case. And I think that uh, 
Lavoy Finnicum does too, and and his family, and we're going to talk about that. But from my perspective, uh, I mean, they're going to have to get through some other things. They've still got the the trial in Nevada to deal with, but I think they've got a great civil rights case. Roger, what do you think? Well, absolutely. Of course, uh, there will be a lawsuit uh, filed by the Finnicum family, and of course. Uh, Ryan Bundy, I believe, will be joining that. You know, he was shot in the shoulder. He has a bullet in his shoulder from that same episode. Shauna Cox also uh, could be in on that same lawsuit. There are other things, you know, Todd talked about civil rights violations. I, it, it's a, I, could, I couldn't begin to list all the civil rights violations from every, every even little things. You know, during the occupation, um, some people who were sort of supporters of the occupants, uh, local people in Burns, Oregon, tried to have a public meeting in the public uh, fairgrounds area and were stopped. I mean, literally, this is a public venue that that is supposed to be open for any member of the public. And yet the local powers that be, Judge Grasty or whoever, uh, said, no, you guys, because you're supporters of the, uh, you know, the Bundys or whatever, no, you guys can't have any public meeting space like any other member of the public can have. You can't use the fairgrounds. That in itself is a civil rights violation. I mean, there are so many little things, uh, um, you know. Just well, as attorneys, can you please right. help me understand this, okay? So it is considered public land, okay? And this is uh, this is this is a question I've been meaning to ask, and uh, I was going to ask you as well, Todd, because, yeah, I got theoretical degrees. I have a degree in criminal justice with concentration on forensic science. I have a degree, bachelor's degree in criminal psychology, and I have degrees in public policy, master's degree, but all theoretical. So I had to be unschooled to find out how the government works. And I have to go through my journey to really understand how the government and all these cases work. But that aside, this is public land, okay? And 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 uh, and these people going on the public land that federal government says has claim on it is considered by them a violation. Yet the federal government can lease this land and let's say give it to some pipeline industry or give it to some Russian uranium company because we have been getting these questions as well. Meaning while the government can take this public land and lease it to some foreign companies, okay, for use, etc., the public cannot go on the public land and hold a protest. Am I getting this right or am I just sounding like an idiot here? You know, Sabelle, I actually think you're you're hitting the nail on the head. That's something that I've uh, scratched my head about a lot from start to finish, as I've heard a lot of people talk about. And again, go back to the media and what we hear. And I hear people talking about, well, they should have brought a trespass claim and all of that. And, and you even heard uh, apparently the jury ask Judge Brown after the verdict, well, weren't there other charges that they could have brought? And she said, well, possibly a trespass claim, but they wanted to stack the deck. They wanted to go after something that would have uh, stiffer penalties in terms of prison time and all of those sorts of things. And trespass just wasn't sufficient. But from my perspective, I struggle to see how they could even make a strong trespass case. First of all, because like you say, it's public property. The sign says, welcome to your national wildlife refuge. There's no gates, there's no locks. The buildings themselves, many of those were not locked. They were not secure and we're members of the public. We pay for all of that through our tax dollars. They, I mean, so they went there. Uh, I personally have a hard time seeing how they could make a viable trespass case. Hypothetically, if they had been ordered to leave, but that uh, at a bare minimum would have had to have happened. And to my knowledge, that never happened. So from my perspective, I think this whole trespass notion is a little bit of a facade, Roger. I'm interested in your opinion about that. Uh, yeah, you know, I can tell you the only evidence uh, that came even with regard to these questions at, at the trial uh, I guess there was testimony by the sheriff, um, David Ward, who testified that he asked 
Ammon Bundy to leave. Okay, well, that's not telling anybody to leave. Then there was testimony later on. I think Judge Grasty said he asked. Now, asking and telling are two different things. There was never any notice, any formal uh, decree or proclamation of any kind uh, indicating that that uh, that they were trespassing in any way or any 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 uh, even that they were violating the law in any way. And um, I, I think that's an important point because, like you mentioned, so you've got Sheriff Ward asking them to leave. You've got Judge Grasty doing something similar. Hypothetically, they're both Harney County officials, but but the federal government is claiming that this is federal government property. And and I've been saying this that the way this handle was handled from start to finish, they sep they removed all separation of powers. So on one hand, you've got the federal government claiming jurisdiction, claiming that it owns the property, but on the other hand. The federal government, who claims to have jurisdiction, didn't issue any notice, any order, any request that they leave, any notice that they were violating the law. Hypothetically, then, the local authorities were doing something like that. But again, if that's the case, what is their jurisdiction? I mean, you've got a conflict of jurisdiction even under the scenarios and the theories that whatever level of government is attempting to assert here. And so I think you just run into all kinds of problems once you had, once you open that Pandora's box, I'm going to call it. Well, and I, I think that um, I remember during the occupation, the, the occupiers were stating repeatedly that the sheriff is the supreme law of the land uh, there in that county. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, Roger, you had access to uh, you know, some of the evidence there, and you, you were there throughout the uh, portion of the trial. Uh, was there any, anything that you had seen that indicated that the government had any foreknowledge of this uh, occupation, or, or uh, was there any you know, surveillance before that occupation took place, essentially allowing them to uh, you know, do their actions and then, as you said, you know, try to set them up kind of a thing, make their case, build their case. Did you, were you aware of anything like that? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, you, different people have different sort of understandings of how the thing started. I think Ammon has testified, uh, you know, that they were, they were basically at a, a little lunch meeting and said, Hey, uh, uh, we need to, uh, this was when they were protesting the, uh, the treatment of the Hammonds, you know, the treatment of the, the Hammonds, uh, Dwight and, uh, Stephen Hammond, who had been sentenced to actually had been uh, prosecuted. I don't want to get too deep into that, but prosecuted for setting a, a backfire on their, on their grazing allotment. And, uh, they had actually gone and served their sentence and had, and were out and then we're told by the Ninth Circuit that they needed to serve a mandatory minimum five-year sentence. Anyway, I don't want to get too deep into that. But the whole thing really started uh, with protests about the treatment of the Hammonds. So they had hundreds of people there to engage in. And this is the middle of winter time, right around uh, New Year's Eve, uh, right uh, January second. Lots of people there, and there were some discussions that uh, you know Ammon Bundy had had with others. And they had met at a little coffee shop, you know, discussing amongst themselves what to do. What I mean, we got all these people. We should do something more. Otherwise, everybody's just going to leave. And we, we we feel like that's a pretty weak, uh, you know, I mean, everybody just came in for a two-hour little parade through the town of Burns. Anyway, there was a discussion at that point. I think the, the evidence, the, the way that I understand it, is that it was sort of a spur-of-the-moment thing where they said, well, there is this mouth here refuge out there by the way it, it came out that that uh, ammon bundy needed a gps device to find the place like it, it was not well planned i mean it, it was rather a spontaneous spur of the moment kind of a decision now having said that there are i i'm familiar with other people who claim that they were set up or invited there or the keys were left for them, or that kind of thing, and there you get all, you read all kinds of different claims and theories. Um, but I think honestly, the evidence, as I understand it, is as Ammon Bundy testified, that it was sort of a spur of the moment, spontaneous thing. Ironically, 
when they arrived initially at the Malheur Refuge, it was vacant and completely empty. It was a ghost town. And the reason for that is the government, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service managers, two days earlier had told all the employees not to go to work. So it was the government that actually impeded or, or uh, g gave the decree for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service not to, who, any, any of them who normally worked there, not to work there because of the, all the, you know, they were so-called militia, quote unquote, guys uh, protesting the treatment of the Hammonds and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and BLM manage the upper management said, well, let's not go to work. We'll, we'll pay you guys to work from, you know, from home or something. Um, you know, days earlier, that decision was made. Um, frankly, I've, I've talked to people who believe in a bigger conspiracy theory that something else was going on. They were all invited to the place. I don't, I don't, I think the evidence is as Ammon testified that it was just really a spontaneous kind of a decision. Well, it looks like our, uh, our discussion, legal discussion and debate on Lavoy Finicum may end up being part three of this discussion because all the, all the great information coming from both of you is leading us to even more questions that are really, really significant. And I don't believe anybody in the country has really heard the answer or even understand it. But I have one macro question, and that is, that has to do with the, in general, the state of the country, how things have been. Uh, Roger and Todd, this is for both of you, the question. When we see a case that comes from the, let's say from the left, okay, it's what we see always, you know, whether if it's race related issue, et cetera, that involves protest, let's say peaceful pr protest, you immediately see dozens and dozens and dozens of NGOs and organizations lining up to defend sometimes in some cases, and I want those people who've been labeling me racist and sexist, I'm a woman, number one. Number two, I'm from Middle East, so that, and I have yellow skin. So you can just shut it off and go somewhere else with that. But what I'm saying is, what we see is dozens, dozens, dozens of organizations that have millions and millions and millions of dollars that even in some cases, they go rush to the defense of the indefensible even, okay? And in some cases, to the defensible, okay? Now, what I don't understand to date, and you said you ran for uh, as a libertarian for, uh, for office. Montana Secretary of State. Montana, yes. Uh, so please enlighten me, because one of the things that left me flabbergasted in this case with this particular case, with these men who didn't commit any crime, obviously they have been vindicated. Where were all these organizations? First of all, ACLE and those people forget about them because my goodness, I mean, they can't be, they can't look at the case, even if it's a huge constitutional case, they have George Soros to worry about, et cetera, et cetera. But where were all the other libertarian organizations and libertarian publications? It's very interesting, Roger, because I was just so overjoyed when I saw your uh, article and I love Lou Rockwell. I go to his site. He has interviewed me several times, but I, I have to say the silence was deafening, deafening from, from the libertarian communities, organizations that they usually boast about being all for constitution, especially traditional constitution. It felt like, it seemed like that these guys with this conviction who are willing to, to engage in this sacrifice, I mean, they've been sitting in those dungeons holes for seven months driven by their faith and conviction, constitutionally, constitutionally sanctioned convictions. And I did not hear from anyone. They were all hiding like little wusses in their little holes, and they felt like this was going to be politically polarized case because all the media, you know, they were against these people. I called some of these people, some of these people who are usually outspoken. They were hiding. The verdict came. And lo and behold, suddenly the floodgate opened. I mean, I see some really great writers like Will Griggs, right, wrote this great piece. But I really wanted to ask, where the heck were you for seven months to counter this media, 
this media that we just talked about, and to stand up for these people who couldn't afford attorneys, many of them, or who didn't trust rightfully, I will not disagree with them. I wouldn't want to have a public defender either. I don't want the court in Portland appoint an attorney for me. With all the respect to all the great attorneys, great talented attorneys, I wouldn't trust them. Duh, there is a brain here. But where were they? Where were these organizations? Where were the conservative constitutionalist organizations? Where was the, what is the name of that party? Constitution party. Uh, where, were, where were the libertarians? Why did they go and all hide and why they were hushing this case? I want to know and I want to hear the answer from both of you because it's been driving me crazy because this is like this is this is this was an assault to their own cause and that's idiotic and I want to hear from both of you Todd okay well from my perspective and and this is something I say quite a bit when it comes to these kinds of issues that we've gotten to the point in this country that so many people uh, are driven or governed or whatever you want to call it by personality instead of principle. And in this case, I think that's really what it boiled down to in terms of so many of those organizations and personalities and people who should have been standing up for principle, but they thought, and this, this is true, the mainstream media had tainted this thing so badly from start to finish, starting in Nevada. So these people who hold themselves out to be patriots are not. They're nothing more than domestic terrorists. Back in 2014, all the way up through 2016, they had tainted this thing so badly that the whole name Bundy was considered to be toxic not just by the mainstream media, but by a whole bunch of other people who should have been standing up for principle, but they were concerned about the personalities involved. Those personalities were considered to be toxic personalities. They'd taken such a hard stand. They had so much backbone that a lot of people viewed that to be too much. And so basically they just sat back rode the fence to wait and see what would happen. And now it's interesting. Two things have happened. Number one, the jury came back with its verdict. And then we had we haven't even talked about the election yet. We haven't talked about the election yet. But this week, the whole world changed. The whole world changed. So now everybody comes out of the woodwork. We had the verdict. They started coming out of the woodwork, but some were still scared about that. Then we get the election. And now all of a sudden, Everybody wants to be on board. Oh, well, this, that, and the other. We believe in principle, but the reality is, and Donald Trump kind of fit the same category. There were plenty of people who weren't willing to articulate or, or you know, voice their support of D Donald Trump for exactly the same reasons, because his, talk, his personality to some people had been viewed to be toxic, and they were not willing to put principle over personality. So that's that's my nutshell view. There's more I could talk, but I, I'm interested to hear Roger's point of view about that. Uh, frankly, you know, it's funny. A lot of the militia organizations, you know, that to the extent that there's a militia movement in the United States, I'm not even sure there's much of a movement. A lot of those guys have abandoned the Bundys. You know, even the people who you uh, would regard as the most hardcore uh, pretty much abandoned them. Um, it, it's funny. Uh, you know, I'm an a you mentioned the ACLU. I, I'm an ACLU member. I, I'm getting emails from the ACLU about this current protest going on out in uh, North Dakota, the Standing Rock, uh, Sioux, uh, the Sioux Indian uh I don't know if I should call it an uprising, but they're having an occupation out there right now. I'm getting ACLU emails uh, saying, well, we, you know, I'm in, in, in sympathy with the, uh, you know, the Standing Rock Sioux um, and, you know, arguing that uh, the, the police uh, establishment shouldn't do a big militarized build up and things. And I, 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 I'm, you know, Sabel, you mentioned, you know, I'm, I also am scratching my head. Where were they? when the town of Burns, Oregon was turned into a fortress with concertina wire in, uh, on, on the roof of the public school and, and uh, you know, heavily armed troops of all agencies 
patrolling the the town of Burns. I mean, where was the ACLU? I, you're absolutely right. Well, this is this is something that I would like our viewers to ask themselves, okay? Because during our previous episode with Todd and Spiro, I brought up the issue. I said I am against the pipeline, okay? I I support that cause. But the discrepancy in the treatment is my question. Now, immediately, people from the left, they started coming and spewing all sorts of hate language in the comment section, which I kicked them out. That's one instance why I, when I like censorship, when people, they come and use ugly language right and left. That's not a debate. If you want to debate, bring in facts. Otherwise, you get kicked out. You want to call it censorship? That's fine. Be my guest. But we do not allow that kind of attacks on our website. That those kinds of attacks discourage really healthy, rational debate. So it was not whether they had a, a good cause or not. It was about the discrepancy, the discrepancy that we see. We get Amy Goodman, Democracy Now!, big check, one and a half million dollars written by George Soros. Go do that. OK, she goes to jail. She's released. I mean, she gets arrested. She goes to court within less than 12 hours. She is released. She's put out there. Now, Pete Santilli, whether you like him or not, I may not like his style. That man sat in jail for seven months. I have no idea what law or whose laws he broke. OK, and from what I see and, and I came to this country at the age 18. OK, I, and I started really studying what this country was about, you know, reading the Constitution, going to university, getting my degrees. I don't know whose laws right now we are operating under because it's not the Constitution. And there was nowhere in Constitution where I studied it that said constitutional is has contingencies, meaning sometimes you have First Amendment, sometimes you don't. Second Amendment is good for this century, but Second Amendment won't apply two centuries later. Or the due process, none of these apply. So who has the power? And as attorney, I want to ask this question. I've been dying to ask this particular question because I was natural, naturalized. I'm a naturalized citizen. I took an oath and I said, I'm going to my oath of citizenship obligates me to defend this nation, okay? It's constitution against foreign and domestic enemies. Now, I want to ask you this as attorneys, you, you are the experts. Really, who in the world has the power to be the enemy of the constitution and change it, pervert it? Syria can't do it, Bashar Assad can't do it. Iranian mullahs cannot dent our constitution, how could they touch our constitution, right? You can't have Russia nuke our constitution because constitution is not nukeable, as far as I'm concerned. Again, I may sound like an idiot, I'm simplifying it, okay? Because I want, I want all of you to help me understand this. The only power that can be considered the enemy of the constitution, put a dent in it, pervert it, okay, suspend it, is the United States of America, the government of the United States of the America, America. And our founding father put it in there that we are obligated to defend it against enemies. And those people were very smart people from what I have seen, what I have studied. So they knew the only ones with power to pervert it, to change it, to suspend it, to damage it, to be the enemy would be the government ultimately, right? At some point. So in this case, these men and women who went there and they protested the government, some other kinds of laws outside this constitution is applying to them. And we, the Americans, all of us, I'm a naturalized US citizen, looking at what's happening. I mean, isn't it incumbent upon us to defend our constitution against the only enemy that is capable of damaging, perverting the constitution? I mean, isn't it, isn't it what the founding fa fathers meant here? So, so Sibel, I told you that before, you're one of the only people that is brave enough to say a lot of the things that you say, but I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that uh, Roger and I would both agree with that. And so what it boils down to is this idea, uh, you're in a little different situation than most people 
who were born and raised as citizens of the United States because most of them, because they're natural born citizens, so they don't need to go through the process that you did that ultimately culminated with you taking an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. Many of them have never taken that oath. Many of them haven't thought about that, but public officials have. But for a lot of people, they don't even think about it. They don't think about the Constitution. They, they don't really care that much about it. But anybody that is a public official, anybody who's an elected official, uh, they do take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And from my perspective, what we're talking about here is the need to hold them accountable. I think that's what it boils down to. A lot of what we're talking about here boils down to the concept of governmental accountability. And the last thing I ever want to say is that this issue is just some kind of big picture federal national issue. I think this is an issue at every level of government in this country, from the federal government to the state governments to the local governments. They're all sworn to uphold the Constitution, and I see the Constitution violated in a myriad of ways by every level of government and the, the public officials just every day, basically. They've come to ignore the Constitution in a nutshell. And I want to come back to something else. A lot of it boils down to, again, who you are. So depending on who you are, they may attempt to, to claim that the Constitution applies and that it applies to you. But if you're somebody else, then it doesn't apply and that they're not required to adhere to the laws and comply with the laws that govern their own actions in office. So a lot of it just boils down to who you are. And one of the greatest examples of that, and we've been talking now for several weeks about the discrepancy between how uh, the occupation at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge was compared to North Dakota. But now we've got an even better example, which is all these violent, not just protests, but riots going on in major cities, including Portland. We've got all kinds of vandalism going on. We've got violence. We've got Molotov cocktails. We've got all of this stuff going on. And look at how that is treated completely differently. We've talked about the occupation. No actual violence, no actual threats, none of that stuff, but it's treated completely differently just based on who you are. And I talked about it before. One of the issues, and I think it's kind of the dividing line that kind of separates who you are is that whole issue of guns. The guys at the refuge were perceived to have guns. And so that was the thing that created, in my view, one of the big overreactions. Well, again, we have a constitutional right to have and bear arms lawfully, as long as we're not committing other crimes, all of those sorts of things. But again, you look at the violent riots that are going on now, uh, the mainstream media, they're not saying a whole lot about it. They are treating that completely differently, again, based on who they are, because they're all the people who are criticizing what the peaceful protesters and occupiers were doing at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. And now, from my perspective, it's the epitome of hypocrisy, because now they're doing what they accused the occupiers of doing. The occupiers never did those things, but now they're doing it themselves and they feel justified in doing it. So uh, again, uh, I don't know where you start and stop when it comes to accountability, but I think you have to start with those people who have sworn an oath to uphold the constitution. I think we have to hold them accountable first. Roger? Um. Well, I agree with everything that both of you have said. You know, sometimes I, I, I give an example of uh, the Operation Northwoods uh, documents. Sabella, I'm sure you're. Uh, I don't know you're, if you're knowledgeable about the Operation Northwoods. Very much so. Yes. Uh, after the JFK movie by Oliver Stone, there was a congressional, I guess, investigation into some of the Kennedy assassination 
uh, documents. And, and and at that time, that was in, I believe, the year maybe 1979, some documents were declassified from that were from 1960, I believe, one or 62. And they were called the Operation Northwoods Plan. And it was a plan by the highest levels of the uh, military uh, complex, the Pentagon, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to kill the American people and to try to get us into a war with Cuba. Uh, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, again, these are the very men who held the highest level, the keys to the highest level filing cabinets of national security in the United States. And they were planning to kill the American people, to machine gun them down, to uh, maybe sink cruise ships and uh, blame it on the Cubans, maybe to crash uh, airplanes into buildings and blame it on the Cubans so that they could get the American people to support a war against Cuba. Now, just think about the irony. And and I, 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 I think that you always have to say that the greatest threats to national security are those at the very top of the government. And that will always be the case in every country in the world. The very the, the, the greatest threat that we'll ever have uh, to our national security is our own government. And of course, there's you know uh, there is a political scientist at the University of Hawaii, I forget the guy's name, Rummel, who has done a, an exhaustive set of studies into all the massacres and killings and genocides of the 20th century, concluded ultimately, and the data is very clear, that the average person in the world is far more likely to be killed by his own government than by any foreign government, any criminal, any terrorist. Uh, our own government, and that's the government of any country, is your greatest source of potential danger to your life. And, uh, <laughs> you know, everything that we're just discussing now is further evidence of that. Well, we are going to have part three, and it's going to be on the case of murdering of Lavoy Finnegan. And we are going to have a very interesting discussion on that topic that is long overdue. Uh, we have been planning this for months, and now finally it's coming together. But with this verdict, so much, there is so much to cover. I have one final question, and it's a hypothetical question. Some may consider it a silly question, and, and, uh, or uncomfortable question. But watching people, for example, in the case of Lavoie Finnegan, he was stopped without any probable cause, without any warrants. He was not breaking any law. You know, he was just law-abiding citizen who was going from point A to point B, what we are all doing every day. And he adhered to his constitution and said, nobody has the right to, to stop me. I'm not doing anything wrong, right? and questioned that, and he basically, his end ended up being death imposed upon him because he really believed and he was adhering to his constitution. Or we have Bundy case in this case, in this particular case, with their conviction, with their fate, they they held on. And 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 my goodness, it's, a, I don't know, poetic justice, I don't even know how to characterize it. But considering the climate, all these cases we are seeing today, and this is again for both of you, let's say there was this possibility to resurrect, to revive individuals like Thomas Jefferson. What would you say that would be the likelihood of Thomas Jefferson today being thrown in jail or sitting on those that the stand, the same one that Bundy said, and going under the trial or even being sent to Guantanamo? If he were to say what he was saying back then and, and, and advocating for what he was advocating back then. And of course, about the right to protest and about the fact that the government should be, you know, fearing the people, not the other way around. What would you say, Todd, would, uh, what kind of an end would he have in this era, in this day, in this time? Well, I, I don't think there's any question uh, that if he were to uh, do the same things today that he and the other founders did at that time, they would be accused and and charged and tried for sedition. Uh, you know, uh, obviously the circumstances were a little bit different at that time, but frankly, not really, because uh, Great Britain, 
the United States, which wasn't a country at that point in time, but the colonies were colonies of Great Britain. Great Britain was the power that was the governing power for the colonies. And so that's not all that different. A lot of people have compared the original 13 colonies uh, to, say, the Western states today that in many ways are treated as colonies of the rest of the United States. They're kind of treated as bastard stepchildren that don't have all the same rights because, among other things, the federal government still retains title and jurisdiction over all of this land and all of this re these resources that the other states, uh, that isn't the case in the other states. So a lot of people make the argument that the, the Western states do not have equal footing with the other states. But but the bottom line is, if someone like Thomas Jefferson and a lot of the other founding fathers with the same degree of conviction raise those kind of arguments today the way the Bundys have or the way Lavoie Finicum has, they would be treated the same way or worse. There's no question. Those It's politically incorrect. It has been up to this point. And again, we've seen it We've seen a shift in the whole stratosphere this week. We don't know what it's going to be like going forward. From my perspective, it's it's still a crapshoot. It's still a crapshoot. I know what was going to happen the other direction. We know what direction that was going. Now it becomes more uncertain. I think it's more of a crapshoot because government just moves that direction, it seems like, in terms of exercising dominion over people. Uh, and, and that's the direction that this whole thing's been going for a long time. But there's no question from my perspective, Sabel, that actually uh, conditions in terms of oppression against people who have the kinds of views we're talking about is much worse today than it was 200 plus years ago in this country. I think we're in a position. And again, I don't know how much of that has changed now and how much it will change over the course of the next four to eight years. I think that's a big uncertainty for all of us. We have no idea what the future holds. If you haven't heard me talk about it before, I'm a big uh, fan of the book, The Fourth Turning, that talks about these cycles and the timing right now and everything kind of seems to fit together that we're coming to the end of another cycle and who knows what that ending of that cycle will entail but it will probably entail some interesting times that we'll get to experience. Roger, Thomas well, Jefferson, let me just... would, he, would, would he be considered a domestic terrorist? Let me put it that way. Well, I'm aware of uh, several, several attempts by people to uh, write down the statements that Jefferson wrote down in the Declaration of Independence into a petition form, and then they will go just to out in the public or on a college campus trying to get signatures on this uh, petition. And again, the petition says nothing more than what Thomas Jefferson said in 1776. And they can't get anyone to sign it because they think it's too uh, criminal and radical. That well, says it all. So let me I just mean, add to that. I couldn't have said it better. I couldn't have said it better. That says this is the state of our nation. This is the sorry state of our nation. In 2002, I had a petition uh, and, and I put it out for people to sign just for my First Amendment right to be heard against the state secrets privilege. Just people support asking Congress to have hearing and override the censorship called the state secrets privilege coming from the executive branch. And this was after 9-11. And nine out of 10 people, they said they were afraid because if they were to sign it, they would end up in some sort of a list. They said a list, list. They would end up in some kind of a list and they would get in trouble or because their son or daughters were in military, they wouldn't get promoted. They would get in trouble. Or if their husband had government contract, they would lose their contract. They would get in trouble. And, uh, and what you just, just said, Roger, is, is that. And, and I hope our viewers can, can just sit and think about the implications of what we are talking about here. Because based on that, you, every single one of you, so easily, easily targetable as a domestic terrorist. It just may be the wrong way you're looking at the TSA agent next time you're walking.
Or it may be because you are watching this program and you're saying, wow, this induced some critical thinking, okay? All these, all these are grounds for, for you to be considered and treated as a domestic terrorist. And remember what happened in this case with the Bundys. They got vindicated and, and that should be a sign for you to just, just engage in some soul searching and try to separate right from wrong. These government mouthpiece and government being the entity that, that currently for the past however many decades or century, the biggest enemy of our nation's constitution and their mouthpiece, the media, versus the truth, versus the people who stand up for the truth. And with that, I want to thank all of you, all of you for, for joining us today on this very, very important discussion. And I hope I can, I, we will have you here back here very soon in the next few days for another recording session to talk about so many aspects of Lavoy Finnecum assassination, murder, that nobody has been talking about and nobody has really talked about up to this point. That's from the forensic evidence to, to actually the chrono chronology of the events and also with the legal expertise on what, what that case was and, and it is, is remains as a case that should be classified as a case of murder. And this is an assassination by our own government of an innocent man. Thank you. Support independent media. Go to kickstarter.com today.